The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Susanna Lovejoy with Everbridge, and today's topic is predictable IT incident responses in unpredictable times. Our format will be a presentation followed by a question and answer session. We'll be discussing the current landscape, how COVID is changing technology, navigating challenges, and key capabilities required to solve these new challenges. At the right side of your screen, you'll see a box for questions, and I encourage you to type one in at any time. Our speakers today, we Prashant Dorisi and Bart Riss from Everbridge, along with Michael Roars from Control Risks. I'd like to turn it over to our main presenter for today, Bart Riss. Take it away, Bart. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, so today we're really going to walk through the challenges that organizations face uh, with incident response living in this new world, which is our post-COVID world. A lot of the things that we're going to talk about are really going to revolve around the acceleration of digital transformation. Uh, digital transformation was a theme that was always occurring, but it is being accelerated uh, by our current COVID-19 landscape. And we're actually seeing certain verticals and industries that are being nudged down the road um, faster than maybe they would originally proceed down that path on their own. Good example is critical services like telehealth and healthcare, um, and also remote learning in higher ed are areas where we're seeing industries be very reliant on their IT infrastructure, which supports their critical IT services that are going to keep these uh, applications up and running. Uh, which means that they're supporting more mission critical digital applications and IT services than before. And that criticality of those services are also uh, being escalated. We also need to make sure that IT organizations are able to be agile and evolve and align with business goals. And as always, we'll touch upon the increased threat of uh, cyber attacks where also compliance is very important. And uh, naturally, digital apps and services are becoming increasingly uh, complex. So these are overarching themes um, that we're hearing uh, you know, from our customers today. The other thing that we want to set the stage with is critical events occur all the time, and they come in different shapes, sizes, and, and types. So based on a study uh, by Forrester, where they polled organizations and asked what type of critical events they experienced in the past 24 months, the ones in circle are, circle are going to be the ones we're really going to be focusing on. So 25% of reported critical events were related to IT failure of a business critical system. 24% uh, were related to uh, cyber attacks. And IT system failures and cyber attacks can be directly correlated with another type of critical event, which is the damage to a brand or reputation. Uh, so as all of us are well aware, whenever there is something major like a, a cyber breach with a big organization, it's something to get out pretty quickly and it's something that is pretty loud uh, from a media coverage perspective. Uh, so definitely, uh, correlates to that brand and reputational crisis. Now, with this, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Roars from the Control Risk team to really talk about um, how some of these challenges are being escalated and elevated uh, in our new world, which once again is that post-COVID world where uh, you know everybody is more remote and some of these challenges are escalating in, in criticality. Uh, Michael, take it away. Thanks, Bart. Um, absolutely. Um, you know, as, as Bart Riley said, um, critical events driven by cyber issues are only one type of a myriad of technology and security risks that uh, our clients are facing as a result of COVID, but it is a particularly prominent one right now. So it's certainly worth looking deeper into how organizations' uh, operational response to COVID has intersected with the cyber threat landscape to create um, some, some interesting uh, and perhaps troublesome trends. Um, from the outset, I will say that 
we actually haven't seen a fundamental shift in the nature of the global cyber threat landscape during COVID, but we have definitely seen, uh, as Bart mentioned, uh, an escalation in a few key areas and a change in focus in a few key areas. So uh, I'll start with the broadest perspective um, and move uh, a little bit towards the more tactical trends that are affecting companies. So uh, kind of at the top, um, we are seeing that things like cyber-enabled espionage, disruption, and disinformation campaigns are increasingly uh, potent tools in kind of interstate conflict, right? Diplomacy, intelligence operations, geopolitics, and uh, economic maneuvering between countries. Um, and in a lot of ways, the private sector, companies and organizations, are in the sort of crosshairs uh, all of all of that, um, especially critical national infrastructure related industries and um, actually populations of people. So, you know, we this is especially true for uh, disinformation campaigns by Russian intelligence services, for example, which we're certainly seeing are continuing their playbook, as it were, from. 2016 to sort of fuel distrust among um, U.S. and other Western countries' populations and the institutions, right? So, um, so of course, in the United States, um, key themes over the past few months have, of course, been COVID, um, but also the Black Lives Matter movement and, of course, the upcoming presidential elections, which we anticipate will continue um, to be sort of you know, even more prominent, right, over the coming months. Um, I think kind of moving on a little bit, um, as I mentioned, um, we have seen a change in sort of targeting patterns or at least the prominence of targeting patterns against certain industries, right? So in particular, North American and Western European countries that are involved in COVID-19 vaccine uh, research and development have become extremely high value espionage targets. Um, we've seen, uh, and several intelligence agencies actually have seen and published uh, reports on both um, Russian intelligence services and Chinese intelligence services aggressively targeting biopharma and medical supply companies um, to steal emerging research and development intellectual property, right, as a way to advance their own sort of national COVID response capability. Um, and sort of unfortunately, uh, we've also seen uh, cases where doctors, individual doctors and hospitals themselves have been used as soft targets um, by states for harvesting concentrated amounts of, of information, right, um, on, on COVID-19 and patient trends. There's one particularly prominent case in South Korea uh, that sort of happened last month, um, ostensibly at the hands of the intelligence services of its neighbors to the north. Um, looking a little bit more specifically than that, um, we're also seeing, of course, as companies have continued to need to rely on software as a service and infrastructure as a service, um, we're seeing that supply chain compromise, uh, which of course has been uh, a prominent portion of the threat landscape for a while um, across industries is becoming even more prominently so, um, including by the way, um, extending our understanding of a company's supply chain to its employees and their home networks, right? Their individual devices. Um, it's sort of not something that we would have considered to be sort of fundamentally part of a supply chain before, but it certainly has been in the era of COVID. So, you know, we've seen campaigns that are focusing in particular on compromising individuals' home networks in a way that we haven't seen that happen nearly as prominently before uh, as a vector into their companies. Um, and then, of course, um, interestingly, contact tracing apps, which um, are becoming essential services in a lot of places, um, are a big concern as well, whether um, from the fact that there are fraudulent contact tracing apps out there, 
uh, designed to trick people into downloading and delivering malware into their environment, home or at work. Um, or similarly to the sort of hospital and doctor example, there are also large um, aggregated um, sort of pools of information, of personally identifiable information, personal health information, which of course increases, um, I think on the other side of this, data privacy risk for companies. Um, and last but certainly not least, and we'll go um, into a couple of stats that bear this out, um, we are seeing that ransomware um, and the whole ransomware industry, professional criminal organizations using ransomware has just sort of skyrocketed in a way um, that we hadn't seen it accelerate that way in the past. So a couple of key stats to sort of bear out. Um, first of all, the organized criminal groups, um, especially the ones using ransomware, they're doing a really good business actually. Um, and it's, it's fairly reliable. Um, and sort of the targeting patterns that we're seeing across industries um, are sort of fairly even. Now, I will say that if you look on the right-hand side, um, the chart on the right, um, we certainly have seen, as I mentioned before, industries like pharma and medical supplies um, being targeted prominently in a way that they certainly weren't targeted that prominently um, in the years leading up to uh, 2020. Um, and then another sort of uh, industry that's really feeling the heat um, is education and training. Of course, as sort of universities, but also um, just, you know, school systems um, uh, sort of across the country have all had to go to remote learning uh, applications. That has become an industry that I think sort of certainly never saw the levels of targeting that it had seen before. Next, please. And sort of as I was mentioning a little bit before, um, so sort of the ransomware groups are, are in particular um, ha are doing a great business. Um, they're sort of targeting industries fairly evenly. Um, it's sort of a, a little bit of a different trend than sort of overall landscape, um, but uh, it works, right? Um, and the organized criminal groups, they know, especially now, that if they're not reliable, then nobody's going to pay. A ransom, right? So it's actually, um, unfortunately, they know that the more often organizations get their data back as a result of paying ransom, the more money they're going to make. Um, it's certainly something that we can and should be fighting against, and and there are lots of strategies for making sure that the company doesn't end up in a situation like that. But that doesn't lessen the fact that this is in fact the trend that we're seeing now. Sixty nine percent is is quite a high sort of percentage of of organizations that pay and get their information back in some way, shape, or form. Next. Um, and then one other sort of particularly interesting uh, stat to bear out, um, again, continuing on the sort of prominence of ransomware during COVID, uh, the average duration of incidents, uh, ransomware incidents to resolve continues to go up. Um, which is sort of extremely unfortunate set of circumstances because, of course, every hour in a ransomware response matters when you're talking operational outage. Um, and as a result of that, organizations are much more willing to pay. Um, and again, the sort of criminal organizations, they know that. So the average demand uh, is going up significantly. We've seen a sharp increase in those. Um, and similarly, the average ransom paid over time is also going up sharply. Something, again, a trend that uh, organizations really sort of need to sort of figure out how to get on top of. I would really love to see uh, that trend start to go the other direction. Next, please. Um, but, you know, if we look at those stats, right, it's, it's unfortunately none too surprising, actually, that some of those stats are going up. I mean, look at the sort of issues that organizations are facing all at the same time, hindering their responses. I mean, their, their response teams are, uh, are almost entirely distributed um, in a way that they weren't before. Um, you know, the organizations that they work for, companies are sort of less able to withstand long operational outages, right? That, that just the business impact associated with that is becoming um, even more intolerable than it was before. Um, and unfortunately, you know, economic downturn at companies has forced layoffs in some cases, which I think across the board is forcing organizations to just absolutely do more with less, more 
less time, less space, fewer people. And what it really sort of emphasizes, I think more prominently than anything else, is how essential it is that organizations get proactive. They look for opportunities to make their response capability more efficient um, and more effective. Um, and certainly that includes um, automating and better coordinating um, their response capability, because these things will happen. Right, and, and sort of how well and how quickly you're able to respond really is the difference between something that is an incident and something that is a crisis. Um, and I, my colleagues um, are gonna spend sort of a lot more time here talking about sort of uh, ways that organizations can help improve the quality of their response. Bart? Thank you very much. Uh, so we're gonna segue into, you know, as to kind of build off of what Michael mentioned is fundamentally uh, old challenges are still there, but now either the scale of those challenges is increasing and the tools that we're using and essentially you know, doing more with less is really putting the importance on how are we going to manage cyber threats, how are we going to continue to manage IT outages uh, and service delivery in this post-COVID world where our resources can be more constrained uh, than they previously were. So it all starts with understanding why managing an IT critical event is so difficult and why you, you need a critical event management system in place to help you be efficient in that management. So fundamentally be able to reliably and efficiently identify what exactly is happening. One of the challenges we already touched upon is that the number of tools and systems that are navigated uh, by our teams on a daily basis is vast. So what triggered the original event? Was it a alert for a monitoring system? Did somebody report a particular issue? Is this information reliable? Uh, the last thing that we want is, you know, false positives, false alerts, uh, when we already have a resource constraint. What type of disruption is this? Is this a server being slow, which maybe is indicative uh, of something like a DDoS attack? Is this a application being unavailable? Uh, is it a network related issue? And then we need to make an assessment of how severe is that issue? Um, so do I have service dependency mappings well-defined where I could automate that data and make quick assessments to assess the criticality of a particular event? And specifically, you know, when we're talking about service dependencies, uh, there could be a downstream effect. So if I have an issue with a piece of infrastructure, uh, what other services and applications could be impacted? How quickly can I identify that and how quickly uh, can I really fully understand what exactly is happening? Once I understand what's happening, we do need to identify, do we care? And if so, how much do we care? So tying that to specific products and services, uh, making sure that um, you know, a lot of services could be managed uh, by vendors or partners in the form of managed service providers, which could also add a layer of complexity of making a determination of, um, you know, how much do we care about a particular issue as we may not have, you know, complete control and visibility uh, to, to certain areas. What are impacted customers and how can that blow back on our brand and our reputation? Um, what are our response teams? Uh, you know, where are they from a geographical standpoint globally? Is this a particular team that has a follow the sun model approach? Is this a particular service that maybe you know, level one support is managed by a managed service provider? How do we have insights on what's going on on that side of the house, which we may not have you know, absolute complete control of? And then once we identify how really you know, severe the issue is that will help us understand the level to which we care, what do we do? Uh, what's the appropriate action plan and playbook? Uh, how do I activate the various response teams? Throughout the process, what internal service level objectives do I have to keep my stakeholders and internal customers informed? Very important. There's so many moving pieces to a critical IT event 
And we'll talk about a little later that they don't typically occur within a silo. Uh, I might have multiple incidents all of a sudden bubbling up because they're indicative of an overarching problem. Uh, and while I'm sifting through that complexity, I do have to maintain certain level objectives to keep my stakeholders informed to, you know, stop the bleeding of every end user calling in with similar issues into the service desk, you know, bogging down uh, my help desk responsiveness. So I do need to make sure I'm also notifying, you know, impacted stakeholders and customers. Now, once we identify the playbook and we're able to actually move through all of those actions to resolve a critical event, how centralized is that information? Uh, since IT, uh, the response process is going to be touching so many different tools and ownership silos, how easily can I aggregate that data into a centralized source to generate things like post-mortem reports, RCAs, to be able to assess the response performance of my particular teams to ultimately facilitate the end goal of being able to uh, see continuous improvement be injected into the process the next time a critical event occurs. So Bart, uh, this is Prashant here. Quick question, this is good. A big framework is obviously necessary, but can we start with something really basic when we look at solutions like these? Is the dispersed workforce? I mean, the fact of the matter is, we want to support our staff in this difficult time because look, the children are home, schools are closed, and, and children don't respect the fact that there's a webinar going on right now. So I want to make sure we support our staff in making sure they can drive a good balance and very frankly, forget the balance, give more importance to their family in these specific times, but that now creates a significant challenge uh, I can't be agile like I used to. And, and the biggest problem I have, specifically as it pertains to outages, is the longer the outage persists, the longer a hacker sits on my network, the longer the virus stays on my server, the worse the impact. So can we start with something simple on, you know, how do I make sure I know that the right people are working on it or, or even have picked up the ticket that I care so much about? Absolutely, and that's a great place to start. And the simple answer here is making sure that we're engaging the right people. Now let's go ahead and first define what does right people actually mean, as there's two fundamental uh, definitions of a right individual when it comes to IT incident response. First and foremost, it's engaging the teams that are actually going to be able to assist and are ultimately responsible for resolving the nature of a particular incident. So if there's a mission critical application that goes out, we need a platform that's going to be able to automatically detect who specifically from a team perspective needs to be engaged. So we need things like reading into the CMDB and picking up on service dependency mappings. So we could intelligently route certain alerts to the correct individuals with the understanding that when it hits the fan and we have a critical event, that often means multi-team engagement. Now, the other aspect of who the right people are, uh, you hit the nail on the head. It's everyone is managing family and work life, and the other aspect is who's available. So once I identify all the teams that I need to engage, it's also my responsibility uh, to be able to effectively reach out to who is specifically available. And that's where escalation management really becomes a focal point of, of that conversation. Uh, we need to allow folks to manage their availability in a self-service manner. So if I'm tending to my family or to my children because they're no longer in school, I should be able to flag myself as temporarily unavailable. Uh, so that way, precious minutes are being saved because the other point that you made, Prashant, is time is of the essence. So I don't want a mission critical alert sitting and pinging my phone when I'm clearly unavailable before it escalates the secondary on call. Self-service is going to be a very important theme um, that's always been important, but now is being magnified in this new world that we are living in. Uh, so we need automated escalation management that supports self-service availability so we're more accurate 
in terms of who the right person is from an availability standpoint. Now, we also need to track those responses. So when I'm engaging to multiple teams, like a MIM team and an operations team, I need to be able to track in real time. If my job is to be the incident manager, I need to know in real time of who I successfully engaged uh, and which other teams are not responding yet and I may need to you know, escalate further. Uh, and then I'll also routing the notification either locally or also globally if teams are running a follow the sub model approach, it can't be a simple flat calendar, right? If, if the incident occurs in the middle of the night on the US, I may have a team that already has a follow the sun model in place. Uh, so that from a global perspective uh, should be automatically routed uh, to the right individual. All right, so I think that makes sense from a tactical perspective. People for us are the number one you know, assets within the organization and we do need to engage them meaningfully. But at the same time, there is a bigger corporate objective at play here. Uh, it started well before COVID. If anything, you know, the pace of that change has only accelerated. Number one is you know, the budgets are not going to be the same you know, I've spoken to a bunch of my colleagues and, and we know at best we will either lose a few percentage points in our budgets or remain flat, but the pace of digital transformation has to change. We do talk about, you know, replacing the old with the new, whether it is tools consolidation or even our method of responding to tickets. And as we used to talk about a lot of vital standards, it's moving to a more agile DevOps driven model. And then we've started doing business with a lot of SaaS companies as we become comfortable. But given the Michael's commentary on the increased threat landscape and the fact that we have to do more with less, how do we now take a strategic view of this big change that we all need to undertake? Like I said, even without this present situation of COVID. Absolutely. So I'm going to start with a uh, multi-part question is going to result in a multi-part response. So to your first point of having new investments, but due to budgetary constraints, also needing to continue to work with legacy systems, it's important to have a very flexible integration ecosystem. So we could fulfill that vision of net, of being able to do do more with what is already in place today. Uh, with budgetary constraints, it may not be realistic to be able to swap out and upgrade every existing tool. So we do need a flexible ecosystem that once again is going to really be important to deliver that concept of self-service uh, from an integration perspective as well. As like you probably experienced Prashant, the monitoring tools that you use often change over time. Maybe when you're assessing your budget, um, you know, you want to go ahead and maybe sunset a, a particular tool to then leverage that investment in another area that's going to be more critical. So you have a changing ecosystem of tools, which is going to require the ability to, in a self-service fashion, also deploy uh, self-service integrations that really bring those uh, disparaging systems together in a management platform, which means integrations between monitoring systems and ticketing systems, um, making sure we're able to do uh, some event and response correlation to limit the number of false positives that maybe get entered uh, by more rudimentary, non-flexible integrations that may just create incidents whenever a particular monitoring alert gets triggered uh, without any intelligent assessment of is this a duplicate uh, or am I just creating additional noise in the ITSM. Now that all comes down to the people side as well because once a monitoring alert triggers uh, you know, an incident within a ticketing system, we need to make sure that we're also uh, covering the collaboration tools underneath that self-service integration umbrella. Uh, so those collaboration tools need to be seamlessly uh, interwoven 
with my ticketing system and my alerting system as well. So if I am a resolver and you already notified me because I am the right individual, I am responsible for this particular uh, service and I am on call, I should be able to seamlessly from that alert also be able to add myself to a uh, chat channel. Uh, or if I get emailed saying, hey, Bart, we have an incident. Have you seen this? Here's the ticket number. If I go to that ticket, I should also be able to have an additional point of entry to also join the ongoing collaboration space um, directly from the incident itself. Uh, and as we move to investigating, fixing, and testing, uh, we have to make sure that um, you know these integrations are really serving all of my various audiences, whether it be my technical resolvers, whether it be offering my stakeholders and customers a self-service capability to be in the know of a particular issue, so they're not just calling the service desk and hammering them with additional volume. So that's really gonna be the first part of that response is making sure that I have an integration ecosystem to bring the combination of new technology investments and legacy systems together in my incident response process. Which then brings me into part two, which is taking those tools uh, and orchestrating the process. So if I do have multiple monitoring systems, uh, throw alerts, maybe on the infrastructure side from a server perspective, uh, and maybe I'll have some cybersecurity alert monitoring systems that may detect potential cyber threats, or the inverse, maybe I have end users calling in particular slowness, which may start as a P3 incident. But then simultaneously, I identify that there's a DDoS event occurring, which I'm able to correlate those two actions. So maybe the server slowness is being caused because a P0 was opened uh, in terms of a security event. Quickly, I need to be able to then escalate that P3 incident to a P1 major incident and perform certain actions as launching a war room. Now, based on that P0 event, maybe my infosec has already been engaged. And the last thing we want is these conversations and troubleshooting to occur within a silo. We gotta bring these folks together and merge them onto you know, one war room bridge because the nature is that IT incidents rarely occur within a silo. There's you know, more often than not an overarching problem that is gonna be causing multiple incidents. And that routing needs to be uh, incident-based and workflow driven. And lastly, once I engage the right people and the folks are on that war room, we need to be able to deliver response automation. Folks are working remotely um, from their homes. So maybe uh, they, it's gonna take time for them to VPN to the network and, and perform the actions that they otherwise would have performed if they were a member of the NOC um, sitting in the operations center. So to close the loop of everything, we want a critical event management platform to offer automation as part of the response process. So if I'm in charge of a particular server and, uh, or a particular service, and a common troubleshooting tactic is to simply restart that service. Um, I should be able to do that from the alert itself, saving precious time um, of me having to you know, connect in and do that otherwise manually. Maybe I want to create a collaboration channel uh, that's maybe a sub-thread with my technical teams. And maybe the organization already uses a runbook automation tool like a chef, a puppet, an Ansible tower. Uh, instead of having to pivot to that tool and run a recovery workflow, uh, we should always focus on having a integrated approach where maybe I could trigger that from the response itself. And once the service is restored, monitoring event clears, we could automatically close the ticket um, and also archive any collaboration channels that can be referenced in the future. So response automation is gonna be that last piece of the puzzle uh, to help support that digital transformation uh, that you're discussing uh, about your organization. But this is very good, Bart, but what you presented creates a lot of things moving together in harmony, a lot of moving parts, right? 
And when you have so many moving parts, when you're living with old tools that need consolidation, when you're adopting new SaaS products and you're trying to mix and merge technology, it becomes very hard to keep your finger on the pulse on exactly where you are, whether it is operational efficiency, whether you know are my teams adhering to the SLAs, where are the violations occurring, right? How are two specific incidents related, right? How do I bring people together? Who are my top performers? So with so many moving parts, while it's a great picture and a great story, unless we can instrument it, unless we have the right telemetry, unless we are measuring how we make progress, this entire system will collapse. So what are the performance considerations and metric considerations to make sure that we know what is going on and we can measure meaningfully where the improvements have to come? Thank you, Prashant. That is uh, an excellent point, which really brings me to the other benefit of having legacy and, and modern investments consolidate together with an integration ecosystem. That's going to allow us to centralize the analytics as well. So if we have multiple tools feeding a centralized critical event management platform, we're going to be uh, at a, in a better position to correlate and really see a high level view uh, and being able to sift out all the noise or avoid having to check multiple disparaging systems to really get the true story of what is going on. Uh, so analytics is what's going to allow organizations such as yours to deliver on continuous improvement. So we could track to see how many incidents are currently open and how are we trending against an SLA um, and being able to identify which teams are engaged, which teams are not engaged, who else do I need from an on-call resource perspective to make sure um, that we could prevent an incident from crossing that threshold. And that's where real-time uh, analytics is going to give you an advantage over things like static reports, because you could see from a situational standpoint where your IT operation stands. So that will give you that wiggle room and time to pivot if you need to or engage additional teams more aggressively uh, because you will have that visibility of who has responded, who has not, what's the trend look like. Maybe a team is hammered and I got to bypass and go directly have a manager to that team to make sure it's getting appropriate attention. And having trend analysis is also really important because there could be certain external factors that can prepare you for a high incident volume before it even occurs. So a good example for e-commerce uh, you know, industries is we have things like Cyber Monday, uh, where we know we're going to have an increased volume of traffic, which could strain uh, my, my particular uh, services and underlying infrastructure, which could help me prepare uh, by looking at previous trend uh, analysis to make sure that I'm essentially uh, ready to handle that uh, additional load also is going to help me correlate things as seeing visually a massive incident spike because I have so many disparaging systems, but if they're funneled through one event platform, I could more readily identify that, whoa, there definitely is a underlying problem that's causing a lot of additional incidents to be created, uh, which is more often than not the reason of incident spikes is underlying problems. Uh, so having these analytics is going to help you assess what the real time scenario really is, giving you flexibility to pivot before uh, something bad turns to very bad, um, and is also going to empower you with data to fulfill your mission of continuous improvement. All right, this is important, but but we just heard the theme the profile of the attacks have changed. The number of ransomwares have gone up. Now we all know what has hit the press, a retailer getting breached, a hotel chain getting breached, right? Uh, so I don't want to you know, name names here, but in 
each one of those cases, if we look at the anatomy of the breach or the hack, it's always the retailers, third party supplier, third party vendor, a partner that they're doing business with. I'm pretty confident of protecting my network, my application, I can hide them under layers of network firewalls, layers of application. But in this new world, as I start working with vendors, just to do incident response, with SaaS vendors for, let's say, contact tracing tools, and other SaaS applications for convenience, the biggest threat, I think, is not, not my application, not my firewall, but the vendors that I do business with. Because the last thing I want is to do a deal with a vendor and, and buy convenience. And the cost of buying convenience and ease of use becomes security. How do I make sure that the, the incident response platform itself is not a threat vector? Yeah, excellent question. And, you know, completely should be one of the most important things we consider uh, when we're dealing with, with vendors, right, is doing our due diligence and making sure that uh, the vendor not only has state-of-the-art security and compliance, uh, especially, you know, not only do we live in a world of digital transformation, but for quite some time, uh, we've also been living in a globalized society. So often, those security and certifications can't only be domestic, but also need to have global coverage, uh, whether it be GDPR, you know, in Europe, for example. But we also missed one point uh, for Sean is in addition to making sure that whatever platform uh, that you integrate your tools and systems with has state-of-the-art security, it also needs to have industry-leading SLAs because the other aspect of a a critical event management platform is it's not going to be able to do its job um, if the platform itself is experiencing an outage. So you need something that's going to be um, always available uh, to be there when called upon in terms of uh, rallying your resources around a critical event. And while doing so, it needs to do it in a uh, compliant uh, fashion and with the utmost security as well. So I'd urge you uh, when you are selecting vendors uh, to also take a look at what certifications that they hold and what is their track record and how established they are on the security front to make sure that the vendor itself never becomes uh, a liability. Prashant, hopefully I answered uh, all of your questions. Uh, if not, feel free to hit me with a follow-up. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna now move into uh, closing the loop on, you know, when we talked about what makes managing critical events very difficult uh, to putting it into a repeatable framework. Alrighty, so First, we talked about needing to understand what is happening, and that's going to fall into the category of assess. I need to be able to have a platform that's going to be able to intelligently uh, assess the context and determine the severity of the particular event that is occurring. Once we assess the severity, the, the next step in the framework is to be able to locate all the appropriate technical resolvers as well as informational stakeholders to, to curb that incoming uh, volume of end users reporting you know the same issue over and over again and that's done by identifying who is impacted um, and you know who essentially needs to be uh, rallied to help those that are impacted and the third piece is acting itself uh, so this is where we really need to be able to orchestrate a process and digitize uh, an other manu uh, otherwise manual playbook. Uh, so if I know that there is a um, vulnerability that has been detected on a piece of my infrastructure, and maybe the, the path is to you know, apply a patch, but in order to do so, I need to open up an ECR, uh, I need to obtain, a, obtain an approval, all of those things can be orchestrated to streamline how much time we spend in that act piece. 
maybe automatically open up that ECR, maybe allow the approver to approve or not approve directly from that engagement. So we're able to then automate the next step of that otherwise manually executed playbook. Once we're able to fulfill our duties and act and restore a particular incident, very important for us to analyze, and this speaks to your point, Prashant, of being able to you know, run uh, performance management and really benefit the organization and, and fulfill your challenge of continuously needing to do more, but without necessarily getting more. Uh, data is what's going to become a very powerful tool to help deliver on that vision because we could take the data that we're getting from analyzing a incident that just happened and then recycling it back into that process uh, by delivering continuous improvement. And just to kind of summarize, I know we talked a lot about specific points. Um, but now we're just going to quickly summarize what are some of the key required capabilities of an effective incident response platform. And regardless of what the nature of the IT critical event is, whether it's a cyber threat, an issue with infrastructure, an application performance issue, or a service outage, we need to rely on a robust ecosystem of integration. And they need to be maintained in a self service fashion. So we can be flexible enough as uh, the tool sets may change. So that will range from monitoring systems to ticketing systems to runbook automation tools. Those are all examples of types of systems that should be fed into an incident response platform. Once we're able to get the data from external sources, thanks to those integrations, we need to be able to intelligently route the alerts to the appropriate parties. So we need to be able to analyze the content of an alert, regardless of what system it's triggered from, and locate the right individuals in a multimodal fashion. So at the core is email is obviously not enough. Uh, to grab somebody's attention during a critical incident, I'm going to need to uh, be able to target them via not only email, but maybe mobile app, uh, you know, SMS, phone call, uh, even when we're talking about healthcare, you know, pagers are still not completely uncommon as a required modality. And once we have that multimodal outreach, if it's going to my responders, I'm going to need things like flexible self-service on-call schedule management with automated escalation. We are living in a new world uh, where we are in a constant balance of work and family life. Uh, so that self-service is really becoming a powerful mantra uh, that's going to empower organizations to stay nimble uh, during these uncertain times. And in addition to my resolvers, we need to allow key stakeholders and customers to proactively receive certain alerts uh, via things like self-service subscriptions to help mitigate uh, eight large influxes of calls into my service desk. And then moving, in, moving through the act is orchestrating uh, certain actions. So it's bringing a potentially globally distributed team together to a virtual collaboration hub, which could be a combination of not only getting them onto a you know, conference call, but maybe also making sure that we could tap into collaboration tools, which the use of those, by the way, is sharply going up uh, when you're looking at tools like MS Teams, Slack, WebEx, being able to ingest that data into the process as well. So if the incident is resolved, we could also archive the chat activity that's been going on within those tools and correlate them to the particular uh, outage that we just experienced. And another part of ACT is bringing in uh, workflow-driven automation to help execute otherwise manual playbooks. So the example I gave earlier was there's a lot of sub steps that happen when there's a major incident. If there's a change that's needed, I need to open up an ECR, I need to gain an approval. Once I obtain that approval, I can actually perform a action, which once again, more often than not, can be automated by something like a script or automated by something like a recovery workflow in a runbook automation tool. So all of that, uh, if integrated with my incident response, is going to drastically empower me 
to reduce the overall MTTR when I'm dealing with IT critical events. And when the dust settles, uh, we also need to tap into smart analytics, audit trails, potentially a recording of a bridge audio uh, so we could do our post-mortem analysis, team performance reports to identify any risks and bottlenecks in efforts to ultimately take all of that data and continuously improve the process and continuously to be able to rise to the challenge of doing more without necessarily getting more. And if applied correctly, that framework of assess, locate, act, and analyze could be something that's applied to all types of critical events, um, you know, IT related or even not IT related to make sure that as an organization, we communicate better, collaborate faster, and be able to orchestrate our response in an agile manner. I think with that, we will save some time for a few questions. Thank you, gentlemen, that was excellent. I do wanna dive right into questions because I've been getting them all along. Thank you everyone for your involvement. The first one is from Elena. This pandemic is forcing my company to reconsider a lot about what we, how we operate post COVID. What are your clients doing effectively to change their strategy or framework for technology and cybersecurity to get ahead of the types of incidents you're talking about? Sure, I can take that one. Um, this is Michael. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, one that's on the minds of a lot of, of organizations, as you said. I mean, I think for me, at the sort of highest level, if you're not already truly focusing on all parts of your technology and cyber risk, now is the time. Um, I mean, you know, really take this opportunity to, to commit in your organization, taking a step back and formally reassess what your risk is for technical disruption uh, and critical events. Um, because in a lot of companies, it has changed as a result of COVID and this sort of new operating environment. So whether that's from malicious action or non-malicious events, whether it's a data exposure or, or outage of a critical service, um, it's it's time to sort of really take a, a good hard look at, at what your new risk uh, picture actually looks like. And that includes, by the way, as Prashant pointed out earlier, it absolutely has to include your supply chain and your third parties, right? What risk they pose to you as organizations rely more heavily on them. I think uh, just a couple other quick points. Um, taking sort of that, that big picture look at what your technology and cyber risk actually is has to include a, a sober business impact analysis, right? So a lot of organizations are really, really not good at, at quantitatively in sort of monetary terms or qualitatively estimating what the potential impact of, of situations actually are, right? How do you make decisions minute by minute, hour by hour, if you don't know how much it's costing you, right? Um, and how sort of what it will take the cost benefit of, of containing the incident versus versus um, sort of the alternative. I think um, just a couple of other things, um, absolutely that must include um, making sure that your broader response and recovery programs around your organization, not just your sort of IT incident response or your IT disaster recovery capability, but also your cybersecurity incident response teams, your business continuity program, your crisis management program, make sure they're connected with each other, right? Because uh, I think now is really a time to focus heavily on resilience, right? Not just prevention, but resilience. And as far as frameworks are concerned, I mean, if you're already an organization that's following a cybersecurity or a technology framework for managing risk, the good frameworks already have um, sort of focus areas on the whole life cycle of managing that technology risk landscape, including the sort of resilience measures that I've just mentioned. Excellent, thank you, Michael. Next question is from Luca. We already use tools today that do alert correlation and orchestration as part of our incident response. How would a critical event management platform integrate with systems like this? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really great question, and you know, hopefully, we covered some of this, uh, you know, in the webinar. But a alert correlation, for the most part, falls into the assess category of dealing with a critical event and the overall incident management process. Uh, and you know, a, a critical event management solution um, can certainly leverage that alert correlation. So if there's already monitoring systems that are doing event correlation on the monitoring event, that is great. Um, and then, you know, that is allowing you to feed that data into a critical event management platform with the noise already suppressed and, and eliminated. But there's additional areas that a critical event management platform is going to facilitate that an event correlation system does not. And that's once we move past the assess and into the locate, making sure we're able to find the right resources, which once again are going to be defined by two areas, right? The responsible resources as well as the available resources. Uh, it's also going to then bring us to the act, which I think is the second part of that question in terms of runbook automation tools and orchestration that may already be in place. Same thing, uh, you can have a chef, an Ansible tower, a puppet in place today to automatically help you restart a service, but more often than not, that's still manually triggered. Uh, so to be able to really close the loop on that and through a critical event management platform, offer the capability of response automation, meaning I could trigger a specific action by not only getting the contextual data within the alert, but being able to provide a specific response that will then trigger a, a particular recovery workflow is only going to add value to those systems that are already in place today. Uh, when you tie all those tools together in a CEM platform, uh, you are essentially getting a better ROI on those tools by having those systems interact you know, with a greater level of synergy which once again should help you fulfill that mission of being able to do more without necessarily uh, investing more in some other you know, monitoring tools or event correlation tools or runbook automation tools, but use everything you already have in a more integrated uh, and automated manner. And I think the last piece I missed on that question, by the way, is also closing the loop on reporting, right? So, if I could have all of that data come into a common platform, then you're also going to benefit um, from a centralized reporting model that should help with that continuous improvement. Now I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Bart. No, that, 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 that is an important aspect. Glad you uh, circled back to that. I think we have time for one last question. This one is from William. What is your response to dwell time and average time to detect an attack? Who, uh, Michael, do you want to take this one or should I take this one? Uh, Go ahead. Okay. So can you repeat that question one more time, uh, Susanna? Sure thing. It seems to be mostly about how do you, what's your response to average time to detect an attack? Anything you can speak to to reduce the time it takes to detect that an attack is occurring? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, obviously uh, we're going to, you know, to detect a particular incident, um, you're going to want a good monitoring uh, ecosystem in place, right? But detecting is only one part of the battle um, if no one is watching or no one is, you know, uh, actually paying attention to a particular monitoring tool or system, which is why we really need to uh, broaden that a little bit, especially in a remote work for a remote remote setting where maybe I don't have uh, a security team sitting in an area like the knock and looking at dashboards nonstop and identifying things that could correlate to an attack happening, uh, which is, you know, definitely an area where critical event management system is going to be able to help to analyze threats that could be detected from a multitude of systems and really funneling it into one uh, critical event management platform and really extending the reach of what that alert would typically do, whether it's email only or alarming lines on a graph in a network operations center to being able to do multimodal outreach to the right people. Uh, 
Uh, and the biggest thing that we typically see based on a multitude of studies that have been done is the real issue isn't necessarily the time to detect that something is happening because monitoring systems do that quite well. Uh, but the issue uh, where a lot of organizations struggle is to really be able to assess uh, that particular monitoring alert or a series of monitoring alerts determine what the criticality really is and engagement of the resources that are going to stop the bleeding. Because every minute that goes by, if an attack is underway, is greatly expanding the damage potential. Um, so that is really uh, the biggest area is not only the time to detect, but the time to know uh, and the time to engage. Uh, all of those together uh, are really going to help you with early detection, which then allows you to mitigate and isolate potential risk of an attack uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you, Bart. And thank you again to Michael and Prashant. We're running up to the end of our hour, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Please stay safe and take care.